So yes, I'm a sociologist from the University of Paris. I'm basically interested in political ecology uh, from a theoretical as well as an empirical uh, standpoint. And lately my field work, work, empirical field work, has been about climate risk insurance. Climate risk insurance. That is the transformations of climate risk insurance in the context of climate change. This is an issue that mostly has to do with adaptation to climate change. My basic question is the following. It is that with rising natural catastrophes in countries of the global south as well as the global north, people will need financial protection more and more against rising risks. And by financial protection, I mean insurance. So as to be able to reconstruct their lives as quickly as possible uh, after a catastrophe hits. Thus, insurance will be a very important part of adaptation to climate change. A crucial question then is the following, what will be the most politically just and also of course efficient insurance system for the future? That's my basic question. Will it be a private one based on market mechanisms? Will it be a public-private partnership like the one I I'm going to talk about today? Or will it be a 100% public one? The, the article you read from Development and Change, the article I sent, is mostly about financialized forms of insurance, and especially so-called catastrophe bonds. But today I want to talk about an ongoing research that is linked with the previous one, but is different, that is going to lead to a second article, hopefully, about a public-private partnership, uh, which is, as I said, another form of climate risk insurance. However, this issue of climate risk insurance also gives me the opportunity, a more theoretical opportunity, but linked to the empirical one, to talk about more generally the link between capitalism and nature, and especially finance and natural catastrophes, insurance being a form of finance. And this will be my starting point in my introduction, and then I'll come to the public-private partnership I was talking about. During the past three decades or so, there has been extensive scholarship about the relationship between capitalism and nature. It has concerned, for instance, the way capitalism profits from natural resources it didn't produce, <coughs> say, raw material of different kind. Or it concerns the way capitalism generates negative externalities, like, for instance, pollutions or natural catastrophes, that it then transforms into markets, like in the case very well known of carbon markets. Much of this scholarship comes from heterodox economic approaches, typically Polanian, Marxist, post-Keynesian, or from strands of political ecology uh, who are interested in economic matters, uh, influenced by authors like Nicola georgescu Reugen or João martinez Alier. The role of the state in this relationship between capitalism and nature, the role of the state, however, has been given much less attention to by these scholars I, would I was talking about. And I recently started investigating this issue, and this is basically, on a theoretical level, what I want to talk about today. My general hypothesis is that the relationship between capitalism and nature is never a direct or immediate one. It is always mediated or articulated in one way or another by the state. That is by state institutions or processes. Of course, the shape of the relationship uh, between the three, I mean state, capitalism and nature, changes historically. And it changes, of course, also geographically, that is, according to the country. But most studies on the relationship between capitalism and nature have essentially focused on capitalism and nature only, without including the state. My understanding of capitalism comes from authors like Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci, or Nikos Poulantzas. According to these <coughs> authors, this strand of Marxism, of political Marxism, so to speak, well, there's no such thing as capitalism alone. The state, the integral state, as Gramsci would put it, uh, is always around. So one has to think about the relationship between capitalism and nature, but also how the state intervenes in the relationship between the two. 
This research takes place in a larger project, which is to understand the transformations of the state in the context of the environmental crisis. And understanding the coming transformations of the state that have already begun, and its evolving relationship with the economy, and especially capitalism, is of course crucial. The state especially will undergo growing pressure in the decades to come to manage the catastrophic consequences of climate change on societies. Hence, understanding the state in the Anthropocene, the state, how a state will evolve in the Anthropocene, in the climate crisis if you want, is a subject we should definitely uh, study more, in my opinion, including for political purposes, not only for analytical purposes, but also political ones. Now, my research question here, the one I want to talk about, concerns a litigation between two French reinsurers, CCR, La Caisse Centrale de Réassurance, La Caisse Centrale de Réassurance, and SCORE, La Société Commerciale de Réassurance. It is a litigation that has taken place in the past decade and in France. This is a French uh, situation or litigation. This conflict between two, these two reinsurers concerns a natural catastrophe reinsurance scheme or system that exists in France, which is known as the Catnat regime, le régime Catnat. I will talk about it in a minute. And my research strategy is that this litigation between these two reinsurers, well, reveals something of the growing tensions of the more and more complicated relationships between capitalism, the state, and nature in the Anthropocene. Just before I start, maybe a quick word about the definition of reinsurance, because I'm not sure everyone knows uh, precisely what reinsurance is. Well, reinsurance is uh, an insurer's insurer. Policyholders, like you and me, we buy insurance policies from an insurer, and the insurer himself will transfer part of the risk to reinsurers. And in return for the risk transfer, of course, the insurer pays premiums to the reinsurer. Generally, it is the, costly, the costliest risks that are transferred to the reinsurance level. Say hurricanes in the Caribbean, say tsunamis and earthquake, earthquakes in Japan, say terrorism in France, etc. These are the costliest risks that are transferred to the reinsurance level. The biggest reinsurers today are Munre, Munich Ray, and uh, Swiss Ray. Uh, these are huge financial companies, and they are one of the earliest globalized financial companies. Reinsurers diversify risks by lines of risk, say property and casualty, business interruption, health, etc., etc. But they also diversify risk by regions of the world. Okay, so this is basically a very basic definition of reinsurance, which is a level that is, so to speak, upstairs uh, from the insurance we know and we buy as policyholders. <coughs> now, a word about CCR, SCORE, these are the companies in litigation, and the CATNAT regime, which is the object of the litigation. CCR, the Caisse Centrale de Réassurance, is a central institution in the French climate risk insurance system, the so-called CATNAT regime. It was funded, founded in the 40s as a 100% state-owned reinsurer. It became a limited liability company in the 90s. But today, CCR remains state-owned. It also partly operates as a private reinsurer in France, but also in other countries. But CCR also functions as a state apparatus, and this is the object of the litigation I will talk about. SCORE, La Société Commerciale de Réassurance, is currently the fourth biggest reinsurance company in the world, after <coughs> Unicre and Swiss Re. It was also founded in the, it was founded a little later in the 1970s. And one important point about SCORE is that SCORE's CEO at the time of the litigation is one Denis Kessler. Denis Kessler. Probably you haven't heard about this guy. It's an important character in contemporary French capitalism. At the end of the 90s, Kessler was vice chair of the MEDEF, 
the MEDEF, which is the French Employers Association. Kessler remains very powerful in the French bourgeoisie to this day, and the business community more generally. Is what one could call a neoliberal activist. That's basically his function in the French bourgeoisie today. He has sought relentlessly to align French capitalism with the standards of Anglo-American capitalism, so, so to speak. So it is important to keep this in mind, this neoliberal character or activist, because the conflict between these two reinsurers, SCORE and CCR, is in a sense embedded in the long-term agenda of a sector of the French bourgeoisie, the more Anglo-American oriented one, the more neoliberal one. Uh, I'm going to talk about it in a, in a second. Uh, I'm sorry? Kessler was Maoist before. He was a Maoist, yes, as a young man. He was a Maoist at the University of Nanterre. Yes, exactly. But now he's no longer a Maoist. Yeah, but one more <laughs> asking, do you, I mean, you did believe uh, about uh, uh, the class, uh, class struggle. And um, he say, I still believe, I just change. Yes, <laughs> he changed side. He, he won, basically, the class struggle. Yeah. He's a very smart guy, a very, well, interesting person in French capitalism. You, you can Google him and you, you'll, you'll listen. You, you can hear a lot of videos on YouTube about, about this guy. This is very interesting. Huh? He published with Strauss. He published with Strauss, kind of, a former finance minister of Lionel mm -hmm. Jospin in France, yeah. Um, very well known for his adventure in New York. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much you know about French politics and French capitalism. Dominique Maybe Kessler. Dominique Strauss-Kahn you know, but Dominique Kessler probably not. Yeah. He's a very interesting guy. And there's people like him in every country. I, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I have to tell you about, a little bit more about this French climate risk insurance system, which is the Catnat Regime, which is the object of my, my research. Catnat Regime stands for Régime d'indemnisation des victimes de catastrophes naturelles. So in English, it's Natural Catastrophe Victims Compensation Law. Climate risk insurance schemes vary greatly throughout the planet, throughout the world. The differences are due to two reasons mainly. First, there's different ways of defining what a natural catastrophe is. There's nothing natural about how to define a natural catastrophe, of course. There can be great differences among countries in the way one defines a natural catastrophe. And the second difference is in the way the relationship between the market and the state is envisioned in each case. So I give you the examples. In some countries, say Great Britain, Britain historically, or Australia today, Climate risk insurance and reinsurance is essentially market-based. So it relies on private insurers and reinsurers, and it is not mandatory to buy insurance policies for major risks in these countries. But Great Britain is different now, but historically. This is why in the case of major floods, for instance, many households and people, the poorer ones, of course, are not covered. They're not covered against floods, for instance. In other countries, like Germany, for instance, or Italy, insurance for natural catastrophes mostly relies on the state. So in the German case, for instance, compensation for the victims, say for floods, for instance, and the reconstruction of public infrastructure goes through the state budget. So this is basically a state system. Between the entirely private and the entirely public, there are mixed models. In the US, for instance, there's a federal fund you may have heard of, which is specifically dedicated to floods. It is called the National Flood Insurance Program. It is very much in crisis today. Now, the relationship between capitalism and the state in France is very particular. This is a very interesting and complex history, the relationship between capitalism and the state in France. This is the whole issue of what we call here in France dirigisme. I don't know the translation in in English, but you can understand nirigism. So it's the intervention of the state in the regulation uh, of economic activity. That is the involvement of the state in the economy. And this dirigism, which is, which is a typically French feature of capitalism, takes place not only in industry, but also in the financial sector, and in this case, in insurance and reinsurance. After World War II, for instance, insurers and reinsurance were among the first companies to be nationalized in 46, 47. The Catnat regime I am talking about here is the product of this dirigiste history. It was created in the 1980s, at the very beginning of the 1980s, and this was one of the first laws voted by the newly elected socialist government of François Mitterrand. 
So it was born in the very beginning of the 1980s. And the originality of this catnat regime as an insurance and reinsurance system is that it combines a principle of national solidarity in the case of natural disasters with private insurance. Now, right after World War II, the constitution of the Fourth Republic of France state the following. This is a very interesting phrase that summarizes what I mean by national solidarity. And I quote, the nation proclaims the solidarity and equality of all French citizens relating to the costs resulting from natural calamities. So this is the Constitution, 1946, the Constitution of the Fourth Republic. So the idea is very simple, is that citizens of a country, here in this case it's France, are not only equal as regards, say, civic rights or social security, they are also equal, or they are supposed to be equal, this is what the Constitution proclaims, when nature takes its toll, when there are natural catastrophes. So this is the principle of national solidarity materialized in the French constitution of the Fourth Republic in the 40s. In France, this combination of the principle of national solidarity, as just stated, with private insurance, takes the form of the so-called mandatory extension of guarantee. Now, this is a technical term. In French, it's extension obligatoire de garantie, mandatory extension of guarantee. Now, it works in the following way. It's very very easy to understand. The policyholder, that is you and me, or a company, will buy an insurance policy for property, say buildings, vehicles, whatever. This policy, the policyholder buys, is called the baseline contract, contrat socle in French. And this baseline contract mandatorily includes an amount, a percentage, which is dedicated to natural catastrophes and the policyholder, that is you and me, we cannot refuse to pay this percentage. We cannot retract from this percentage. And this is called an additional premium, or sur premium, all right? Which is a percentage of the premium you pay as a policyholder for insuring your car or insuring your house. And this additional premium will automatically, this is the important point, automatically give the policyholder, you and me, a right to insurance in the event of a natural catastrophe. All right, this is basically the foundation of this catnat regime. Now, a crucial aspect of this system is that this additional premium is indiscriminate. Indiscriminate. That is, all persons or companies living in France pay exactly the same amount, regardless of their exposition to risk. It is not because you live in a risk-prone area, or, for instance, a flood prone area that you will pay more of this additional premium. It is the same premium for every citizen. So say, as a person living in Paris, I live in a region where there's no, say, storms. But as a French citizen, I will pay the same amount as a person living on the Atlantic coast, all right, who lives in a region where the risk is higher, of course, of storms. So the idea is that through this sur premium, through this flat sur premium, there's something of this national solidarity between citizens in France that is, that is expressed, all right? Of course, the premium itself will vary. It is, of course, more expensive to insure a house on a beach where storms occur frequently than in Paris. This is the premium part. But the sur premium is flat, so there's no difference. And this flatness, so to speak, is again an expression of the principle of national solidarity between citizens uh, in the case of natural catastrophes. This is a, a way to construct a nation in a sense. A nation that is constructed not as regards civic rights or social security or other features of modern nation states, but in the very relationship between each citizen and a natural catastrophe that can occur anywhere on the national territory. CCR is the Catnat regime's reinsurer. So private insurers transfer part of the risk to CCR. So when a natural disaster costs exceed a certain level, this is how reinsurance works. Yes, please. So the sub premium is it proportional or is it like fixed? No, it's fixed. It's flat. It's fixed. It's the same percentage. Yes, please. And the assurance 
not to the Supreme, but to the assurance of a house or a car is, is mandatory? Or not? No, it's not. Okay. It depends. In a sense, France is one of the society where insurance is the more, is, is, it's 95% of people uh, insure their houses. Yeah. So in practice, it is, it is, it is quasi mandatory. But it's not mandatory. But it's not. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Other questions? I don't think so. No. no. So the, what is called the multi risk uh, the assurance multi risk part of it is uh, mandatory, but I think uh, the apartment itself is not. It's not mandatory. I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah. Well, other questions? Yeah. So when a natural disaster hits, or more exactly, when a natural disaster's costs exceed a certain level, well, the CCR will take charge of the payout. Interest, say, will transfer 50% of the risk by paying premiums to CCR, and CCR will cover the equivalent 50% of damages uh, beyond a certain level. Right? This is basically how reinsurance uh, works. So this is the first level of risk transfer. This is the one that goes from insurance to reinsurance. However, there's a second level of risk, and this is where it gets interesting, in my opinion, that goes from CCR to the state. All right. The first one for, goes from the insurance to CCR, and then there's a second one that goes, that goes from CCR to the state. CCR benefits from the so-called guarantee of the state, la garantie de l'État, the guarantee of the state. This means that in the event of a very large disaster, when normal reinsurance cannot deal with the level of payouts involved, so these, these are very big disasters, well, the state becomes the insurer of last resort. And here the mechanism is exactly the same as at the lower level between, I mean, private insurers and CCR. That is, the state takes charge of damages when they exceed a certain level, uh, and in return, CCR will pay, will pay premiums to the state. In other words, the guarantee of the state is not free. You have to pay for it as CCR. However, and this is also a very important point, the amounts involved in case of a very big disaster are potentially much higher for the state than the level of premiums that are paid by CCR. In practice, this means something very simple. It means that unlike normal reinsurers, CCR can never go bankrupt. Never happens. Because it is backed by the state, obviously. So reinsurers going bankrupt after catastrophic events, say 9-11 in New York, uh, or Katrina, or uh, Fukushima, etc., is a pretty common phenomenon. <coughs> it happens, not a lot, but it happens. But this cannot happen to CCR. And of course, this has many implications for CCR and for the reinsurance sector in France. Especially, I'm going to go, come back to this later, the level of premiums, that is the calculus of risk, CCR can offer to insurers is, of course, greatly influenced by its position and especially by the state guarantee. And so is the competition with other reinsurers. I'll come back to this in a second. So this, I will maybe pass this. Since, since the 19th century, in some, the state has played a role of insurer in last resort for great catastrophes. But according to the country, this takes different forms. So this is the form it takes in, in France. Defining what counts as a natural disaster is a crucial aspect in this system. And the reason for this is that the CATNAT regime is triggered only when a certain type of natural catastrophe hits. Hence, the nature of the catastrophe, the ontology, so to speak, of the catastrophe matters greatly. Its natural characteristics, that is, the speed of winds, the level of rainfall, the diameter of a hurricane, the magnitude of, a, of an earthquake, these are all very important aspects of the natural catastrophe. However, ultimately, what counts as a natural catastrophe, and this is an important point of my paper I'm trying to write now, what counts as a natural catastrophe, in the end, is always defined by law. By law. French law defines natural catastrophes as cases, and I quote again here, this is a Quote. It's a bit long, but you, you'll get the idea. It's very simple. As cases of uninsurable, uninsurable direct material damage to property caused by the abnormal intensity of a natural agent. When, this is the important point, when normal measures to prevent such damage 
could not avoid their occurrence or couldn't be taken. So the idea is the following. There's something called the state of natural emergency, l'état de catastrophe naturelle, which is decided by the government. It takes the following form. The ministries of the interior, of finance, and of the economy form a special committee, which is in charge of evaluating the, the importance of the damage and the importance of the catastrophe. Is it a major catastrophe? Is it a smaller catastrophe? And based on stuff like weather reports and other scientific data, this special committee decides if the definition applies or not. If the law applies to this specific kind of catastrophe or not, or case of catastrophe. So one could say that in France, natural disasters are defined, of course, by scientists in a sense, but also by ministers, governments, high-ranking civil servants, and the Ministry of Finance and of the Interior. What interests me in this, in this empirical research is this complicated way of defining what a natural catastrophe is. Of course, from a scientific point of view, but also a financial point of view, and as I'm going to say, in a, in a mostly political point of view. This is the important part of my, my talk. Now, the crucial point, and I'll get... How much time do I have? I have time left, yeah. The crucial point I want to come is this, and then I'll talk about the litigation between SCORE and CCR, which is... <coughs> as is clear from the definition I just gave of natural catastrophes in French law, the damages covered by this system have to be uninsurable by the conventional market system of insurance. They have to be uninsurable. In other words, catastrophes or perils like snow, heavy snow, or hail, la grêle, hail, or storms of normal intensity, say smaller storms, in principle they are covered by normal market-based insurance mechanism. Safety measures can be taken, and generally, these safety measures are effective. Hence, these so-called normal natural catastrophes are excluded from this catnat regime. They are excluded. They are not considered big or major enough. But the important point is this. It's that, obviously, what is insurable and what is not is a matter of conflict. It's a political matter in the end. It's a contentious matter. For instance, by subsidizing premiums, the state can construct an insurance market, hence allow insurability, where there is no market in the beginning. Likewise, by building a dam, une digue, a dam, that might, well, the state might finance a dam, for instance, that might help lower the level of risk, <coughs> enhance the level of premiums, by diminishing risk. Enhanced by diminishing risk, by, it helps insurance and private reinsurance emerge as a market, as a free so-called market. So my basic point is that insurability is a political construct. Insurability is a political construct, and this is exactly what the system shows. What the conflict, especially between SCORE and CCR, is going to be a conflict about the limits of insurability in the context of France today as climate catastrophes become more frequent and more severe. Questions? Until, is, it, is, it, is it pretty clear? Okay. So, the issue is insurability. What are the conditions, scientific, that is material, um, financial, and mostly political conditions of insurability? And insurability is a, is a conflictive notion. And SCORE enters the scene in September 2012. This is when the litigation begins. The Société Commerciale de Réassurance. And the goal of SCORE can be quite simply put, it wants to terminate the guarantee the state gives to CCR. It wants a neoliberal revolution. It wants the state no longer to give a guarantee to CCR. In other words, it wants to replace the French model of climate risk insurance, this catnat regime, by a more market-based system where private reinsurance, score especially, but not only, would play a much bigger role. And this, of course, would considerably modify uh, not only the system I'm talking about here, but the very principle of national solidarity that is um, in, the, in the Constitution of the Fourth Republic, the, the quote I, I gave you. Why? Well, because there would be less pooling of risk at the national level. There would be less pooling of risk at the level of the country. 
This neoliberal revolution is in line with a long-term project by a, an important sector of the French bourgeoisie, of which Denis Kessler I was talking about is a very known and prominent representative, which is of suppressing the regulations of capitalism which were established in France right after the Second World War, and of which, as I said, the Katnat regime is an expression, in a sense. Skor used mainly two arguments in this litigation, and both of them, it seems to me, are very interesting. First, the guarantee of the state amounts to an illegal state aid to CCR. It is a breach, especially, of European competition law. The guarantee of the state, according to SCORE, is a breach of European competition law, which is supposed to forbid, to prevent state aids. SCORE argues the following. It is that the prices CCR is able to offer on the reinsurance markets, that is the level of its premiums, the premiums it asks to insurers, are influenced, of course, by the guarantee of the state. Because of the state guarantee, in fact, CCR is given the same ratings by rating agencies as the French state. And for instance, in its ratings of CCR, Standard & Poor's, I've done interviews with people dealing with this uh, issue, Standard & Poor's explicitly, when it gives ratings to CCR, considers the reinsurers, so CCR's, privileged relationship with, uh, with the state. So this backing of the state has a very important implications. There's something that is more even connected to the insurance market, which is the following. It's that the requirements in capitalization of an insurer depend on the ratings of the reinsurer. The better the ratings of the reinsurers, your reinsurer as an insurance company uh, are, the less provisioning you have to do because the ratings are supposed to reflect the financial solidity of your reinsurer. So that in the case of natural catastrophe, your reinsurers will come to the rescue and there's not going to be any problem. So this means, because of this requirement of less capitalization, this, mean that's, this means that the, re, the insurer can invest more of its money, of course, and hence profits follow. I'll come back to this argument if you want later. Secondly, according to SCORE, this is the second argument, the guarantee of the state will put excessive pressure on public finances in the future. Why? Because in the context of climate change, with the growing number and severity of natural catastrophes, well, it is the taxpayer who will have to pay the damages if CCR stays connected with the French state. Ultimately, according to SCORE, this is what their lawyers uh, argued in the courts, it is ultimately the taxpayer who is going to pay the damages, and this is unfair to the taxpayer, according to them. Their argument, and SCORE was backed in this case by other big global reinsurers like Munich Ray, they helped. I, I have proof of this, this was not public, but people told me, people involved in, the, in, the, in this litigation showed me some documents showing that Munich Ray or Swiss Ray would be very happy to do away with Katnat regime and construct a, an insurance market. Uh, the argument is that reinsurance market, reinsurers have capacity that could be used instead of the state budget. Of course, you understand that this goes back to the, to the flat tax on, on, on premiums. What SCORE and other private reinsurers would ask in return, in the case there is a private market that emerges, is that they, be f they are free to select risk, of course. This is the important point. They would be able to select risk much more than in the current system. You understand that with the flat premium, with the sur premium, everyone basically in France is covered. So this has one implication, is that you can go and buy a house in a risk-prone area, and this means that there's going to be solid national solidarity for you. So the price signal doesn't work in the French system. You, you understand this argument, yeah. So there's no incentive for people to leave floods-prone areas because everyone is covered. Score's argument is that we should do away with this system, uh, go towards a market-based system, select risk much more, 
and much more, of course, rely on the price signal to prevent people from going to buy houses in places or to stay in houses where we know now there's floods and natural catastrophes. So in a sense, in this alternative system that SCORE uh, favor, favors, there, there would be much more risk selection, there would be differentiation of premiums, so the surpremium wouldn't be flat anymore. That's the, the basic argument. Now, the French state took the defense of the guarantee. The French state defended the guarantee, and behind it, it defended the principle of national solidarity I was talking about. Now, this defense is in itself very interesting. At the end of the 20th century in France, and many other countries, there have been plenty of privatizations, as you know. This is the neoliberal revolution. Privatizations in France implemented by left-wing and right-wing government as well. We were talking about Dominique Strauss-Kahn. So it is an interesting question to ask to know why wasn't CCR privatized? Why wasn't CCR privatized as many other companies in the French private, private public system? And why is the Catnet regime still here with us? Well, the main reason is fairly easy to understand is that enough actors, private actors, in the system take advantage from this public reinsurance scheme. And hence, many private actors have an incentive to maintain it in existence. More specifically, thanks to this system, this Gatnat system, very influential insurers like AXA, for, ins for instance, which is the biggest French insurer and which is one of the 10 biggest insurance companies in the world, well, they benefit from very cheap reinsurance. And more precisely, they are able to transfer part of the costs of natural catastrophes to this state-backed regime. Hence, most insurers back the state in the litigation with CCR. So the insurance company and the state were against SCORE and the reinsurance companies in this case. This is the main front line, if you want. Yes? Uh, CCR is then a state-owned company, yes. or is it a private? No, it is 100% state, but it's a, it is a limited liability company. It's a société anonyme in French law. So it is, yeah. but it is, it is state, state -owned. basically it's state-owned. It is not state-owned in the sense of the 50s, but it is, yeah. it is controlled by the state. But it also operates as a private reinsurer, so it has a double, a double role in a sense. It, it's a system of the Catnat regime, but it also operates as any reinsurance company in the world. So operates in the Chinese market, the, the US market, etc. Other questions? To be more precise about this interest or incentives of uh, insurers uh, to back the, the regime, the guarantee of the state can be considered a kind of implicit subsidy, an implicit subsidy granted by the state to the insurance industry, industry through CCR. Now, you may have heard this phrase, of course, implicit subsidy. This is a notion that was used about banks in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis, especially in the US with the Trouble Asset Relief Program, so-called TARP program, which was put in place to save big banks. These are the infamous too big to fail uh, banks. And the argument goes like this, certain banks, this is the implicit subsidy argument, certain banks represent a systemic risk, Hence, states cannot allow them to go bankrupt. And this explains the bailout, and etc. Cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, implicit subsidies have many negative effects, you may have heard of. First, because banks know that the states will come to their rescue, well, they take more risks, of course. And because they are systemic, the too-big-to-fail policy, paradoxically, will increase the risk-taking it will increase the systemic risk instead of diminishing it, which was the purpose of the policy at the beginning. And secondly, uh, the state guarantee, or more generally the implicit subsidy, will improve the ratings these banks receive, receive from rating agencies like Standard & Poor, and hence decrease the interest rates at which they will borrow. So credit is cheaper for them, and this creates distortions of competition with banks who do not have the, the implicit subsidy. Now, my point is that this guarantee of the state given to CCR 
is in fact an explicit subsidy given to CCR, but it is an implicit subsidy given to the whole insurance industry operating in France. Not only AXA, which is a French company, but all insurers uh, who operate in France. And the explanation as to what CCR was not privatized, whereas many, many other companies in the same period, the 90s and early 2000s, were privatized in France. There was a neoliberal revolution in France, like in many other countries, but CCR and the Catnat regime were not privatized. The main explanation, in my opinion, according to my research, for now at least, is that precisely the, the, the insurers have backed the system, the public guarantee, because this is a form of implicit subsidy which is given to them, and uh, it allows uh, to uh, obtain lower interest rates and reinsurance rates. Now, I could, how, how much time do I have left? Uh, I, will, I will conclude, I think, and we can go to discussion. Yeah, yeah, we can go to discussion. I think I've said enough. The important point is do you understand the problem. I'm not giving any solutions here, but just the pro general problem. Yeah. So I conclude, and uh, we can go to the discussion. So I come back to my, by my initial point about capitalism, nature, and the state, which is my theoretical question in this, uh, in this, uh, in this research. Now, I think this conflict between SCORE and CCR illustrates three basic points. The first one is that when one studies the relationship between capitalism and nature, and in this case, insurance and natural catastrophe, insurance and natural catastrophe, a very important place should be given to the state, to state institutions and state processes. The level of implication of the state in the insurance process is crucial. Now, let me give you another quick example, which is not taken from natural catastrophes, but which is taken from terrorism, and which shows what I just said, that the level of implication of the state in the insurance process is a crucial aspect of the problem. In the US following 9-11, insurers dropped terrorism coverage from their policies. Why? Because insurers thought they were unable to put a price on the terrorism risk. And they thought, anyway, that the risk was too high to price. So they said, we will no longer, after 9-11, in the months after 9-11, we will no longer cover terrorism in Manhattan. In fact, no one knew at the time that there would be no other major, at least, attacks uh, in the future in Manhattan, until now at least. Manhattan, where, as you know, one of the most expensive real estate in the world is, and where, consequently, the insurance premiums are very high. Now, people who have studied this retreat from insurers from Manhattan have showed that this retreat from insurers was, in fact, an attempt from the insurance industry to compel the state to take on a greater share of insurance against terrorist attacks in Manhattan. So they wanted to push the state to take a greater part in covering terrorism uh, in, people, in places like, like New York. Now, in fact, it was not successful. What the state did is not pay more. They compelled legally the insurance industry to come back and to cover terrorism in Manhattan. So there is private uh, coverage for terrorism in Manhattan today. Okay. So this shows you that insurability is fundamentally political. It's a relation of force between different actors present and especially between the insurance and reinsurance industry and the state. The state could have paid, they could have subsidized the premiums, they could have done many things. What they chose to do is to enforce the law, in fact, which compels the insurance. So you understood the point. Second point, what the conflict between CCR and SCORE shows is that these frontiers between capitalism, nature, and the state, or say here, insurance, natural catastrophes, and the state, are constantly evolving. They are constantly evolving. These frontiers, or limits, are subject to strategies of different kinds of private actors and public actors. 
In the case I'm talking about SCORE, but also other global reinsurers, CCR, the French state, Fr the French, French high-ranking civil servants in the Ministry of Finance, in the Ministry of the Interior. I didn't talk about this, but the people in the Ministry of Finance were more in favor of a reform, of a new liberal reform, which is, of course, expected. People in the Ministry of the Interior were firmly against. So there was including a conflict inside of the French state as to what should we do about this catnat regime. So the conflict is not only between the state and capitalists, it's inside of the state, and it's inside of capitalists since, as I said, on the one side you have the reinsurance industry, and on the other side you have the insurance industry, which receives this implicit subsidy through CCR. Yeah, I hope it's clear. Yeah. So this is, this is one of the important points I think one can uh, conclude from this research is that the frontiers between finance, nature, natural catastrophes, and different state apparatuses are conflictive and evolving frontiers. My third and final argument, and I'll stop here, is more, say, abstract or theoretical. It's not very clear in my mind, but I'll, I'll just state it. It is that, in a sense, one could say that the state constructs nature for capital to exploit. The state constructs nature or natural catastrophes in certain ways for capitalism to exploit or not to exploit in the case of the catnat regime. Through infrastructure building or the creation of property rights or the subsidizing of premiums or the building of dams, stuff like that, well, the state constructs nature in certain ways or delimits frontiers inside of nature in certain ways so as to allow capitalism to exploit certain parts of nature, of natural catastrophes in this case, and preventing capital to, to do so. There is a very interesting concept by Christian Parenti who's a, who was a student of David Harvey, so it's radical geography, Marxist geography, Christian Parenti. He, he calls the state an environment-making entity. Environment-making entity. This is very, in, in, my, in my opinion, a very interesting concept. The state makes environments in different ways, of course. Some of these environments can be exploited by capital, others cannot. And the interesting issue is, is what kind of nature, of what kind of environments the state constructs and where do the frontiers pass between different types of nature. So in the case of the Catnat regime, the state defines what counts as a certain type of natural catastrophe, which is covered by this system, the Catnat regime, and by doing this it draws a limit between insurability by private market mechanism and uninsurability, that is a system which is public private, which is covered by basically by the, by the state. In other words, the state will weigh or influence on the insurance industry's solvability and profitability, in the, of course, in levels in the, in the present and, and the future. And this is, I think, uh, this is, I think, to come back to, the, to, the, to the, the works I was talking about, the research I was talking about, Polanyan, Marxist, and post-Keynesian about capitalism and nature. It's been 30 years now that uh, scholars, mostly heterodox economists, have talked about this issue of capitalism and nature. You may have heard, heard of people like Jason Moore, for instance. Uh, there's, there's many of them. Uh, Larry Lohman, very, very interesting people. But I think one of the flaws in this research is the absence of the state. We should reintroduce the state and think of a relationship not only between capitalism and nature, but three entities, which is capitalism, the state, and nature. And again, I'm not saying one can analyze this, these three, three entities in an abstract manner. One should, one should always uh, try to understand how the relationship between the three are specific to a country, a region, a historical phase, and how this evolves. Okay, I'll stop here. Thanks. Sir. <laughs> Thank you so much. So thank you, Professor Tasmik, uh, for your presentation. Uh, we will take some of the points that you mentioned in your in your paper and try to uh, take it into a more 
international kind of issue uh, relating, of course, with the courses that we've, we've been having in the master. So, um, Fariha, are we ready then? Um, thank you, Professor, for your insightful presentation. We really enjoyed reading your paper. Um, so, Francisco and I, we are going to present now. But before starting, um, we would like to ask a question to all of you. And the question is, um, how many of you had an insurance when you were in your origin country? The insurance can be uh, life insurance, health insurance, or property insurance. If yes, can you please raise your hand? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you so much. Um, next question. Can you again please raise your hand uh, if you're from developing country and you had an insurance? If you're from developing country and you had an insurance? You had. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. So it's just, um, I mean, we had to take this opportunity because in EPOC we have such diverse uh, background students. So we just showed you the real representation of the world, like how many people have the insurance and who doesn't. Maybe it's not the best sample, but it's fine. <laughs> All right, um, so we will quickly go through the main findings. Um, the first one is that um, economic, okay, first of all, the concept of insurance is developed with the idea that um, in the near future, there's going to be an uncertainty that's going to hit you. And for that, so that you can tackle that, so that you can, you know, step on your feet, um, that's why you take the insurance. And that's how the idea of insurance is developed. Um, <coughs> So um, economic and technological developments give rise to new risk. So these new risks are actually, uh, the prof professor mentions about nuclear. Um, he mentions about um, climate change. Um, with this new risk, the principle of sufficiency uncorrelated no longer functions in insurance industry. So um, rather now exist hypercorrelation. So this basically means that <coughs> that when the insurance ins insurance industry um, goes into the business, they make sure that there are certain um, uncertainty from which they can profit, and that's how they do it. But as the climate change has come, so it's it's more or less. Um, strong correlation that there's going to be an impact. Uh, there's going to be an impact on everyone. All right. Um, okay, so I mean, the main findings already have been explored by professors, so we will just quickly go through some of the graphs. So what you see here is the natural disasters per continent from the year 1900 to 2019. So what you see is how uh, gradually, this continent, um, the number of disasters have increased. For example, if you see here, the green one represents Asia, which has grown a lot. That is very evi evident, and also for Oceania, for Africa, so the numbers are actually quite growing. And one of the things that has triggered is climate change. Okay. So the next graph is about total frequency of natural disaster per type and region. So it is based on the regions um, and the type of natural disaster. So for example, we have here southeastern Asia where the flood is the highest and also here southern Asia we have the flood. Uh, but if we see here in eastern Asia we have the storm. Um, if we see uh, here in Northern America, um, so storm is higher. Next slide. Um, and if we see the total deaths due to natural disasters from the year 2000 to 2019, um, so we see that because of um, blue 
is storm. Um, in southeastern Asia, people have died a lot. Next. And this is the graph that represents cost of natural disaster losses worldwide. So if we see here, what we are seeing is that how the economic losses and insured losses are, um, there is a very evident gap. For example, in 2020, we see that, actually it should have been here, um, um, the value of estimated economic losses is $268 billion. And here, um, the value of insured losses is 97 US billion dollar. So this, this um, gap you see, that clearly tells us that um, some things are not getting insured and some things are, and that is called the protection loss. <coughs> okay, so for developing countries, there is a dilemma and that, what is the dilemma? And that is that even though they are at high risk, but there, there, there exists um, low insurance penetration. <coughs> so if we see this graph, for example, this is the South Asia. Um, so if you see the scale, the lighter it is, it means there are lower insurance penetration. Uh, and also here we see less colors, this means even in these regions, um, the number of <coughs> insured people is less. Um, okay, for example, if we see here, <coughs> in India, the Philippines, and Indonesia, insur insurance penetrations is around 0 0.5 to 0.6%. Europe and whereas Europe and the US has insurance penetration of 3.3%. Um, so this clearly tells us that in developing countries, the number of people who are insured is less, whereas in developed countries, the number is higher. <coughs> exactly what we got to see in the beginning, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we are going to talk here about micro-insurance. So what is this concept of micro-insurance? So it is very close to microcredit. However, it is in terms of insurance. So what's happening here is that <coughs> in, poor and in poor urban communities and rural areas, organizations uh, have long been servicing financial needs to less, uh, uh, needs of less fortunate already exist. Okay, so let's just say it like this that um, in poor areas, um, people do not have access to commercial banks because they don't have the collateral to give to the bank, right? So, <coughs> um, so what happens is that, um, sorry, <laughs> all right. So they d the poor people do not have the collateral to give, so commercial banks do not give them loans. And that's where microcredit comes in, and they try to give loan without collateral to the poor. So um, this is microfinance, and what is happening with microinsurance is <coughs> um, the insurance companies saw that there is a huge difference in the number of uh, developed countries and developing countries and seeing the potential of their market, they moved here. But it is also true that uh, the amount that the poor can give as premium is very less. Um, so that's why um, um, the, mic uh, the insurance companies, what they're doing is working with microfinance companies in the uh, in the urban areas. For example, <coughs> if we see Philippines example, there are 2,000 microfinance institutions who have been providing credit and financial um, to over 7 million clients who previously did not have access to any banks or any facilities. Um, so this is how 
microfinance and microinsurance are working hand in hand in rural areas in developing countries. So I have a question about this, but I will ask it later. So I'll hand it to Francisco. Thank you, Fariha. Well, <coughs> so as, as uh, Fariha just showed, we've seen uh, there's a differential impact of climate change across regions, across countries, and uh, there is also um, a differential Thank you, Mael. A differential uh, capacity to to face these this, uh, increasing natural risks, right? So, uh, in this sense, part of the uh, we can we can think of insurance or the, in the insurance industry, insurance and reinsurance industry as part of the adaptation measures to face to um, uh, climate change impacts. Uh, in this sense. Uh, a very brief uh, historical uh, review shows that the emergence of the, the um, uh, natural risk insurance schemes are intrinsically linked to the emergence of the world market and imperialism. We would go back to the days of the discovery, the so-called discovery of Amer the Americas. Um, and then, since the 19th century, uh, the reinsurance companies, as Professor Rasmig was just uh, pointing out, were one of the earliest uh, globalized companies. Uh, Lasonic and O'Sullivan also put uh, a central role of institutional investors in the rise of financialization and shareholder value. And we can therefore think of this uh, we're trying to move towards the, the linkages between the insurance and reinsurance industries and financialization. Um, and in a way, the neoliberal proposed, let's say, to the neoliberal proposed to, to face these, uh, these new risks. Um, so can we think, therefore, as a, a neoliberal climate adaptation global system based on market, uh, market mechanisms? And if so, how, uh, which would be the, the limits and vulnerabilities of such a system? So uh, let's go to the balance sheets then of the insurance companies. We can see here in this graph uh, how the composition of the assets of insurance companies uh, and, and well, the importance of mainly bills and bonds we can also see equity, land and buildings, uh, some cash and deposits, uh, according to, um, to this data provided by the OECD. Um, and we can make a linkage between corporate governance, of course, and the, sh the rise uh, of shareholder value orientation uh, and the way uh, this may impact on uh, climate change, of course, in the in the behavior of corporate uh, investment and decisions, and also from the point of view of the, these assets um, constituting the collateral through which insurance companies uh, would, would face the, the financial burden uh, in case of natural disasters uh, occurring, occurrence. Uh, in this other graph, we can see the participation of foreign insurance companies uh, as a, a market share, uh, and basically from left it's literally 100% in Estonia, and we can see developing countries, of course, while uh, developed countries are more into the right uh, side of the of the graph. Uh, this high participation of uh, foreign insurance companies um, also implies a financial interconnectedness at an international level. Uh, which mm, is important to understand the, the rise in financial fragility that this, that the, um, this uh, sort of neoliberal regime to face climate change uh, impacts supposes. Uh, and through that channel, uh, through the, the, um, the financial instability of, of this scheme, we can also uh, link it with the differential capacities of the states to, to face these, um, these natural disasters. Uh, I will talk about this later, but uh, 
this is a good example because the, the paper you wrote it was in 2018 in fact and then we had um, we had the, the experience of the pandemic so it is interesting to see how of course countries uh, in the global south and in the global north were had different space of monetary and fiscal macroeconomic policy to respond to this emergency. So with these elements, I propose to do a conceptual simulation uh, inspired by the, by the, um, by the paper uh, of Professor Rasmig. Um, so let's say, let's imagine uh, a natural disaster with worldwide, worldwide effects as a, as a first step. Uh, then we have, of course, impacts, damages, losses uh, affecting households, some with or without insurance, depending on the on the segment of population and the and the country, to firms uh, and public sector. Insurance companies, in this situation, will have an increased liability because of the burden of responding to the damage and losses produced by the natural disaster with worldwide effects, and also a reduced assets, as we've seen on bonds and bills and equities, because precisely of the impacts of this, of this um, natural disaster. Uh, now, basically, the insurance companies may be able to financially respond to it or not, and in the second case, of course, we have a default risk, and um, a default risk of the insurance firms, which as we've seen, uh, these, are, um, these are internationally uh, embedded in, in this, in this uh, monetary and financial system, which supposes an, uh, a, pos a potential international financial fragility, let's say, if, if, fin if insurance and reinsurance cannot meet the, their, um, their financial uh, burden. So, this is where the state intervention would appear as an insurer of last resort. Um, however, this means that uh, financial rescues and in, in the case of state intervention would rescue these insurance and reinsurance companies, uh, that the state effectively can rescue them uh, and this raises some questions regarding the monetary sovereignty and the possibility to effectively emit in, by the monetary authority, uh, pretty much as we saw in the case of Lehman Brothers, uh, if in the case I didn't. No? Um, so what would be the macroeconomic and distributional effects, especially in the global south, in the context of a, a balance of payment, a constrained economy? Uh, so basically, this would be like a, a very simple way of thinking on the mechanism of on how financial instability would be added to environmental instability uh, in this neoliberal regime. And in this sense, connecting the international financial system and monetary system uh, through this, this uh, pro neoliberal proposal to face the um, to face the the impacts of uh, climate change, uh, my question I I put it put forth this question is who would actually be are are states especially in developing countries are states um, able to macroeconomically rescue these uh, these insurance and reinsurance companies in the eventual case of a worldwide natural disaster and if they are not who would be the um, the insurer of last resort uh, considering of course the quasi uh, international uh, money role that the US plays and the and the lack of a, of let's say a unified uh, or democratic international monetary system um, for my question first i would like to quote um, of professor liod so he said Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so he said, micro insurance is not a charity, it is a business. How can you make any money from a policy scheme where the premium is just a few dollars a year? So uh, my question would be, 
Microcredit is a privatized finan financialized scheme for ending poverty in developing countries, which is again a political goal. However, it has been criticized uh, by many scholars like Naila Kabir, Jude Fernandez, about that microcredit is bringing capitalism to the poorest of the poor. Um, so, um, and also similarly micro insurance, which is again becoming privatized because micro credit and micro finance are working hand in hand. So to what extent the government should intervene to ensure public welfare does not get overlooked for private institutes aim of profitability because micro insurance is again a business. So that's my question. Thank you. Should I answer? Or do, do. Yes, you can answer Thank you for the, the great discussion. Um, I don't uh, I don't have all answers to your questions, but um, the first thing I would say is that uh, there is no such thing as a natural disaster with worldwide implications. Natural disasters can be huge, very important, but they're always regional. You see what I mean? Uh, if you've seen the movie Don't Look Up, this, is, this would be a natural disaster with water, but this is not our situation. You, you understand that very well. This is, this is not a very, very good comparison with, na with climate change. This is not the way climate change is going to function. You, you see what I mean. Uh, so n natural catastrophes can be big, they, they can be major, they can be, in a sense, long in their duration, but they're always localized in time and space. And this is what allows for the existence of reinsurance. Because as I said, reinsurance uh, diversifies risk by lines of activity, property and casualty, health, etc., and also by regions of the world. So a great, a big reinsurer will compensate some risks taken in Japan with other risks taken in California, etc. So it is not conceivable at this in the existing system, that a risk would affect California and Japan at the same time, in a sense. You, you see what I mean? There's no such catastrophe that I know of, maybe you've... W what could it be? Apart from don't look up in that kind of scenario. You, you see what I mean? So the very existence of the diversification of risk of insurers and reinsurers is the fact that catastrophes However, major, important, etc., are always regional, in a sense. Yes, please. But would the, the, the principle of hypercorrelation yes. wouldn't, wouldn't go in that, in that line? Yes, that it's hypercorrelation is the fact that in, a, in an insurer's uh, uh, liabilities, there's, you, the, everyone doesn't have a car accident at the same time. This, 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 this is, this is uh, the, the, the absence of correlation. Now, the argument of hypercorrelation is the fact that with climate change, major catastrophes, uh, risks are pooled in very, uh, in very, uh, how should I say, at the same time, in a sense. But this doesn't change the fact that they're regional. There's some kind of hypercorrelation, but this hypercorrelation doesn't correlate risks in California and in Japan at the same time. Did you understand what I mean? So you're right. There is hypercorrelation, but it's not worldwide. And were it worldwide, so that would put an end to the insurance industry, to the modern insurance and reinsurance industry as we know it. It would render it impossible, I think. You, you see what I mean? So maybe in this case, the state would step in. Maybe the US state or the UN or whatever. They would have to do something, maybe. But I, I can't imagine, I can't see, even in climate change, catastrophes so big that they would affect all regions of the planet at the same time. You see what I mean? This is, this is something we have to, to take very seriously because the, the, the space-time of climate change or of the environmental crisis is something that is not very clear because not many people have worked on this topic and this is something we should think about much more. This is not a case of one major catastrophe hitting the, the whole of the planet. It's not that way. 
this is gonna, this is gonna, the Anthropocene is a new period that is going to last for hundreds of years. There's going to be many, 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 many catastrophes, but regional ones. Many people will die, but not at once, not at the same time, I mean. You understand? So uh, your hypothesis is very interesting. What would happen in that case? But this is science fiction, in my, <laughs> my opinion. It wouldn't happen that way. You understand? But would it happen that way? I think the state should, should, would have to step in, and not only in the role of insurer of last resort, but and says this is what I was suggesting when I, when I, when I said that there is, on the planet there is no insurance system for climate risk that is 100% public, that I know of. It's always either a market-based system or public-private private partnerships, but there's no 100% public one. But maybe that's the kind of option we, we should go to if there were such things as catastrophes that would affect the whole of the planet, you see? The Anthropocene or the climate crisis is going to be many catastrophes in many places, but not at the same time and not the same catastrophes. And this is the very condition of possibility of insurance and reinsurance. A risk should always be located in space and time for it to be covered by insurance. This, for instance, is the reason why there's no insurance for desertification. Because it's a process, it's a kind of never-ending process. So you don't know where it begins and where it ends. So you can insure it. It's impossible to insure it. You understand what I mean? There's no insurance for the growing, um, how do you say it in English, the, the rising level of sea. You can't insure that because it's, you don't know where it starts, you don't know where it ends. It can have consequences on such and such house, for instance, or such and such community. And that you can ensure because you know where it starts, where it ends, and you know how to localize in space the community or, or the house you're insuring. But the process itself you can't insure. So, uh, uh, so you understand what I said? Yeah. So this would be one, one answer. The, the, the question on micro-insurance, it's the, the question from Lloyd's, from the paper from Lloyd's. Uh, it's, uh, well, you, you have to have hundreds of millions of premiums. That's the only answer possible. You have to have lots of people who pay very little premiums so as to make it profitable. This is one part of the answer. So, for instance, where, when Swiss Re or Munich Re or these people or the World Bank uh, go and, and propose for, for micro-insurance uh, systems to be put in place in places like India or China, etc. What, what they want is for the governments to ensure that millions of people are going to, to adhere to the, to, the, to the system. So this is one condition. And the other one is subsidizing by the state. It can be the state where the micro insurance system is put in place, or it can be the state of origin of the insurer or the reinsurer. So, for instance, Swiss Re, which is a Swiss company, as you, of course, you, you understood, works with the Swiss government to put in place systems, systems of micro insurance in places like India or Ethiopia or etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, the subsidy comes from the country of origin of the reinsurer and not of the country, not of the government of the country where the system is put in place. So that can happen too. So this is thought as a form of cooperation, international cooperation between governments, uh, governments and civil society, or governments and uh, private enterprises and companies. So these would be my, my two, uh, my two uh, answers. Uh, Maybe there's a reference. Have you read the Daniela Gabor's paper, The Wall Street Consensus? You know what that is? It's a great paper about de-risking. Uh, and it's, it's not about insurance, but it's clearly about the, the link between pri pri private and public uh, entities in the context of, say, climate change. And all. It's a very, very interesting paper.